thank you very, very much. That was absolutely fascinating. I'm usually a very strict chair. I tell people five, ten minutes, but I was absorbed by learning from your fascinating, fascinating guest lectures. I'm really, really happy. I just want to let you know how the guest lecture will follow now. I have asked uh, Professor Mark Pausty to act as a discussant, and he will, in five, ten minutes, just elaborate and comment on uh, Jim Baojin's lecture. Uh, Mark has been recently in China, at least twice, I think, so he has got some insights from his trips and, uh, and kindly agreed to act as a discussant. After that, I will open the floor to, uh, uh, to a debate, and we'll get two, three questions at a time for our guest lecture. And after that, you're all invited to refreshments where coffee was served at the beginning. So now I leave the floor to my colleague, Professor Mara Thank you so much, Thanks very much, Francesco, and uh, thank you, Tim Bauer. I enjoyed that very much. It was a fascinating overview of environmental law in China. I suspect the chair may be rather stricter with my time, <laughs> time, time limits, so I will, I will try to be, to be concise. On the one hand, when you listen to the development of in, environmental law in China, you're actually struck by many similarities with the United States and Europe in terms of the stages, the types of regulation that, that are employed. So there are actually there, there are many similarities. And the, the UN Convention on the Human Environment was a spur for environmental law to a large extent in the UK as, as well. I suppose thinking about, about differences and, and, and problems which, which you identify, the legal structure is more complex and less integrated than you would, you would find in Europe, but it's, it's very positive to learn about the moves towards an integrated pollution control system, an inter integrated ecosystem management system. So that's an area of difference where, where perhaps there's obviously scope for, for simplifying and making the, 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 the legal architecture more, more coherent. Another difficulty seems to be the multi-layer administrative system because you, you have obviously the provincial environmental protection bureau the municipal environmental protection bureau the county epbs and there's a, there's an issue there about i guess turf wars about who, who enforces <laughs> regulations um, and you mentioned in your, in your, in your presentation puck passing and, and, and so on, and mission creep. To, to a large extent, in the UK, which is obviously a tiny jurisdiction co compared to, to China, I mean, we, we've moved towards integrated agencies for pollution control for natural resource management. But that's clearly simply not possible in China because of the scale of chi China, but it, maybe there's scope for provincial level EPBs to take the lead because they would be less involved in local politics and sort of pressures for economic growth than municipal governments and, 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 and so on. Um, it's also struck, you, you didn't say much about enforcement. I was, I was going to ask you, ask you about enforcement. When I was in China recently, I, I gave a, a paper on kind of comparative enforcement between UK, US, and, and China. I understand in the Chinese system, it's mainly civil penalties are the, the principal enforcement mechanism, and very few cases actually come to the, to the criminal courts. Um, that's quite similar to the United States, where there's a heavy reliance on civil penalties. The tradition in the UK, obviously, has been very much on use of criminal law, but we're, we're, we're switching away. But what struck me from reading some research that was carried out into the use of civil penalties in, in China fairly recently was the very low level of penalties, and there's really a lack of deterrence. Whereas today, in, in, in the UK, we've often been criticised for saying enforcement is a really weak link of environmental law. But recently, you know, there have been cases where there are fines of 100,000, 200,000 pounds, which are beginning to become quite significant for economic actors in, in the sphere. So it, it would maybe be interesting to hear a little more about your, your views on enforcement and 
whether the use of civil penalties is correct and, 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 and such like. Public participation is, is, is I, I was glad you, you said so much about public participation. Obviously, um, it's largely through things like the EIA regime and also through the, the, the information regulations. We like to think in Europe that we have very well elaborated systems of public participation and you know, we have rights and, and maybe the laws are more operationalized than they are in China, but there are huge problems with participation here in terms of lack of awareness. The, the authorities don't engage effectively with the, the public. So many of the issues that you face in China, we actually face here at a slightly different scale. Um, but, but I suppose there's a challenge for government there in, in terms of educating people about the rights which they have. But there certainly seems to be a willingness in China, at least at central government level, to encourage participation and criticism in, in environmental matters, which is very, very positive. In, in terms of access to justice, I understood that the civil procedure rules in China had been amended recently to allow licensed non-governmental organizations to challenge governmental action or inaction. And I think when I was in China in March, there was an environmental NGO successfully challenged a failure to act by one of the provincial EPBs in one of the environmental courts, which, which you mentioned. So that's actually a really positive step forward in terms of enhancing access to, to justice. I, I, th I think the, the NGOs and the environmental NGOs in China are characterized as being non-political, but I, I haven't really come across any NGOs which are <laughs> non-political in, 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 one, in one sense. Um, one question I, I did occur to me, which would be interesting to hear your, your views about, and it, in, in a sense actually comes from a guest I have in the audience today who's one of our applicants for a PhD who's intending to look at land use planning law in China. Um, in the UK, one of the fundamental ways in which we actually protect the environment is not through strictly the environmental law system, it's actually through the land use planning system. And we integrate environmental impact assessment with land use planning. So the fundamental decision is about should we put a factory here or an incinerator there? And that's land use planning. Environmental law then controls what comes out of the factory or what's discharged into, into water. So I wondered actually if you'd like to say a little bit about the interrelation. Well, how effective is land use planning law and are, are environmental considerations actually taken into, into account um, in, 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 in China? Um, again, I'm struck by the similarity in the increasing shift towards economic instruments, which is, is, is happening here. And I guess in a system where you know, the, the, there is corruption and so on, economic instruments can actually be much more effective than command and control because there's less scope for any kind of negotiation. You just, if you discharge this, you pay a charge. You pay a charge, for example. So it, it, it can be a very useful mechanism. But equally, I understand there's a huge complexity of economic instruments in China, and their interaction is 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 is, is again, it, it could be improved, and the overlaps could be reduced. So um, I think that probably uses up all my mm -hmm. time. But I, I hope those were useful comments certainly on what I thought was a, an excellent and very, very entertaining presentation. So thank you very much. I would ask uh, our guest lecturer if he wants to comment immediately on uh, Mark's very interesting comments. I think we can stay here if that's okay for, uh, okay. for the rest of the audience. Uh, let's do this. Still have it. Okay, thank you so much for the uh, valuable uh, multiple uh, comments and questions by Professor uh, Posty. Actually, <clears throat> I, I want to firstly uh, give some feedback to your comments about the uh, uh, administrative structures. China is a uh, 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 single system country. Yes. Yes, um, we have a central government, we have a provincial government, we have a uh, uh, local government. But uh, normally the uh, 
uh, they have some kind of uh, division of uh, the, uh, I mean, the authorities. So the, I think uh, most tasks are is undertaken by the uh, uh, municipal EPP. Yeah. Uh, then the uh, uh, provincial EPP and the MEP only uh, deal with some uh, uh, major or important uh, issues. Uh, as to the second comment, actually, uh, I, 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 how to say, I, this is my, my uh, purpose to avoid the enforcement. Topic. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry. The thing is that it's, it's very uh, not. No, I, I, I'm, I'm not <laughs> refused to talk about it's uh, quite difficult and it's. Uh, it's Maybe it's another 40 minutes to talk yeah, about yeah, the yeah. Oh, sure. <laughs> uh, enforcement. Um, the, the enforcement issues in China is uh, very bad, actually. Yeah. Not only in the field of environmental protection, but also in many other law branch. So it's, uh, how to enforce the law, how to uh, got, uh, get a uh, good effectiveness of the, the, the law provisions. It's a bigger challenge for the Chinese government. Uh, the, the problems of enforcement uh, have several reasons. First, is, as I mentioned in the, during my presentation, uh, we have a not so perfect legislation. The government don't, don't, don't know how to enforce uh, exactly. Second is that the, uh, the environmental departments at each kind of... Uh, each level of uh, government are weak government organizations. So they are not in somewhere, they are not in the mainstream of the government. So the lack of, uh, the lack of uh, uh, money and uh, personnel and uh, uh, equipment, especially at the local level. Uh, certainly, maybe the, the, the reason behind that is that they we have to say that in China, the economic development is, is more important than environmental protection, especially at the local government, because the, according to the China's tax uh, system, the local government must get its own money from the local uh, companies. So the, the local government sometimes will relax the, the, the environmental requirements or standards. Directly or indirectly, so it's a it's a it's a huge problem actually <laughs> of the uh, enforcement. So the the but we have still have some uh, good signs to to improve the, the the enforcement. One way is the uh, the participant and uh, pu public participation. Uh, through the uh, uh, right to know or right to participate or right to sue. So the, uh, the rule of NGO uh, is one way to promote the enforcement. But, yeah. uh, then to your, your question about the land planning, actually China, one of the principles of China's environmental law is prevention. Mm -hmm. So the, the land planning and the other preventive uh, measures are main component of environment law in China. But uh, it uh, is related again to enforcement. We have very good, very beautiful planning, but uh, <laughs> the, the planning just planning. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the government can change the planning as they wish. No legal responsibility. So, so, of course, the China are not so bad, actually. It seems that the, the China is terrible, according to my presentation. But uh, we are improving the, the situation. The, the China has a divided. We have uh, several different uh, planning. We have post is national, uh, uh, actually, it's zoning. And we have uh, four uh, very big zones that for different uh, zones have a different uh, requirement. For example, we have uh, 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 the sensitive zones. That means uh, the 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 the, uh, the heavy industries are not allowed totally in that area. 
we have the national environmental uh, planning and uh, we have a uh, specific uh, planning for air pollution and uh, uh, water pollution, including the land planning. Yeah. So, so, but uh, the core of the problem is how to enforce them. Okay. So one way is that to strengthen the um, uh, strengthen the the, the, the uh, rule of the, uh, the NGO and to 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 encourage and to push the public participation, then to revise the existing law to make it more clear. Yeah. So the third way is to try to make the, the uh, court um, independent because in China the, the local court are mainly uh, dependent uh, depending on the the, the uh, local government. So the local government in some way can control the, 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 the court. So the court and the judge are not so independent. For example, you mentioned the, the several NGOs to to bring the, uh, the uh, so-called public interest uh, litigation against the government. But the NGOs uh, actually are not really NGOs. They are dunga, actually. They have a strong governmental uh, background. And uh, it's a very interesting situation that the, we call it the transboundary strategy. That means the NGO in other provinces can against the... the <laughs> The, 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 the uh, government organizations in these provinces. It's a similar situation in media, in media uh, reporting. Yeah. So this, uh, the how to uh, ensure the, the, the independent, uh, independence of the, the, the court and the judge is a very important issue for China. So, so the, this is a complex situation in China, how to prove the law, law enforcement, including the, 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 the environmental enforcement. Okay. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to now open the floor for debate. In order to make this as um, lively and interesting as possible, I would like both members of the audience and guest lecturer and discussant to be, to the greatest possible extent, brief so we can have more interventions. <laughs> Uh, also, I would like to kindly ask you to introduce yourself and your professional affiliation. So we'll take two questions at a time, if that's possible. I have one there and one there. So let's start up there. Yes. Hi, thank you very much. I'm Melissa Savaris from the University of Edinburgh. Um, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. I was intrigued by your comment on the fact that Chinese law is inspired to an extent by European law. And the EU is particularly keen in becoming a norm exporter in the environmental field. Um, this also has implications for how it's received abroad, in the sense that sometimes the EU attitude is regarded as imperialistic, <laughs> in the sense of imposing its own standards upon its partners or even non partners. Um, another aspect is external, in the sense that. Um, for example, in the forest sector, the EU has increasingly asked its trading partners to comply with its rules. And China is now the largest importer of forest products in the world. And I was wondering if this sensitivity is developing in China as well, or if instead this is still a remote concern for the Chinese lawmakers. Thanks. Can we take one more question? Yes. Hakim? My question. Um, Sorry, I'm Hakim. I'm lecturer in the School of Law and a member of this centre. Um, the question has to do with the issue of internationalisation of Chinese um, environmental law. I wonder, these days, in the UK, virtually every product is made in China, from shirts to ties to suits and all of this. And I imagine that some of the pollution we we saw it on the slides. Um, actually, has to do with maybe the suit I'm wearing. Yeah. Okay. Now, where talking about the EU and and um, its standards and China being interested in that, we don't have that sort of pollution here. Do you not think that the companies from here who set up industries in China play a role in undermining? 
the um, environmental laws, or is it a question of the economic um, benefits on the Chinese side, making the government and the uh, authorities look the other way? How can this question of internationalization positively be brought in there to, to make the situation better? Oh, that's okay. Please. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm not so sure if I understand your question clearly. And uh, you mentioned that sustainability uh, topics in China, in the forest area, or more broad? What do you ask from your commercial partners you know, when you import forest products from mm -hmm. the Congo? Or um, is this an issue? Or is it becoming an issue in Europe or United States? Yes, 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 yes. Is an issue yes. what kind of standards are deployed locally? But I was wondering if this is... Yes. 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 Uh, the, 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 the the central government actually uh, uh, in the in the past few years, the China is mainly uh, a country to attract investment from outside the world. Uh, recently, uh, many uh, Chinese government uh, uh, Chinese uh, state-owned companies or the uh, private companies go out of the world to invest or to board. Uh, to, to buy the, the things from other countries, for example, in Africa countries or in other places. So, so normally, it's, uh, at the very beginning, uh, the, the, the idea of the government, the, the companies is to say that we, what we should do is to follow the local laws and the local regulations. But uh, since two years ago, the, the Ministry of Commerce and the Ministry of Environmental Protection issued a kind of regulations on the uh, uh, on this topic that uh, when you to uh, invest overseas or you when you buy the, some uh, rural materials from other countries, you must pay attention to the uh, two uh, uh, criteria: one is on the environmental protection, another is on the human rights. They give a guidelines on how to uh, control the behavior of the company. But uh, it is only a kind of a soft law. They have no legal responsibility. Uh, but from the legal perspective, that uh, uh, it's no problem for the, the companies to only comply with the local law. This is only kind of a, a corporate social responsibility for the Chinese uh, companies. In some way, I can say they now they have realized that the, 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 the importance of the uh, CSR. They are trying to uh, transform their activities, or uh, their uh, behavior, into more environmental friendly or more. Uh, um, human rights friendly way. But uh, it needs some time. Uh, you, you mentioned the, the situation that uh, we have some debate in China that, uh, uh, for example, we are now uh, we call it China as the, uh, the, 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 the world factory. So we produce many productions, we sell many productions to all of the world, but uh, we keep the pollution within China, uh, especially the in terms of uh, emission yeah. of CO2. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it seems that it's not so uh, fair for Chinese government, for Chinese company to to be alone the, the, the responsibility to to control the emission treaty. At this stage, it's, uh, it's kind of a joint, seems joint responsibility for the sellers and the and the buyers, you know. But uh, as, from, as to the relation between the national law and the international law, for, for China alone, it cannot make too many change for the situation. And we can own, what we can do is that to strict, strictly enforce our law. But unfortunately, as I mentioned, the, because the, the um, the current uh, the economic situation, the financial system in China, the local government 
uh, has few own money to maintain uh, the development of the city. So he, uh, it needs some actual money. Where the money comes from? It's the tax from the local companies. So that's the main reason we have the so-called uh, local practitioners. Mm -hmm. uh, the, sometimes the local government relaxes that. Although we said, as a, when I studied environmental law 20 years ago, we said, oh, there's a pollution transport. The pollution transport means the pollution, blue, uh, pollution products or pollution uh, uh, equipments from Western countries to China. But now the pollution transfer has another meaning. From developed part of China to mm -hmm. developing part of China, from eastern part of China to middle and western part of China. We have a law uh, called as um, uh, so, uh, uh, prevention and control of uh, uh, solid uh, waste. We have a strict uh, provision on the uh, pollution control, uh, pollution transfer, but uh, against the enforcement. <laughs> So it's, uh, for some local government, uh, even for the general public, uh, if they can get the salary from the, 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 the companies, they can get some, some uh, immediate uh, money. They are not so interested in the, the, the long-term damage. So that's the big problem. Mm -hmm. If I could comment just very briefly on Hakim's question from a climate change perspective, um, China has obviously been reluctant to, to accept the greenhouse gas emission targets. Hakim's question, in a sense, provides a very good justification for, for, for doing that, because we have exported pollution to China, and much many of the greenhouse gas emissions which are being made are for exports of, of, of products. So one can actually sympathize with China's position in the, the climate change regime in that perhaps it ought not to have the same kind of targets as a developed state because so much of its production is actually associated with export to developed states where the products are con consumed. We'll take a few more questions. One there. One there. Let's start with Ms. Wazu, yeah? Yes. Um, thank you for your presentation. You mentioned the existence of a disclosure of information law in China. I was wondering if you could say a bit about um, its implementation and the impact of such a law on the culture of secrecy, of governmental secrecy in China. Mm -hmm. and can we take a question from this side? Yes, yes uh, thank you. I'm Anil Monroe, a lecturer in Chinese politics at the University of Glasgow. Um, my question is, uh, related to enforcement, it's, it seemed very clear from, from what you said that, that uh, it would be difficult to do, uh, to improve the enforcement without some kind of political reform. So from a from perspective of constitutional law, if you were going to start to address this issue of um, enforcement, where would you start? What would be the first reforms you would consider? Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe I can I can answer your question, your two questions combinedly. Yeah. <coughs> uh, I think it's the most important thing to the to ensure the public participation, including the open information and uh, participate in the uh, decision making. We have already a good uh, uh, open information law. Uh, actually, it's not law; it's regulations and uh, uh, ministerial uh, decree. We have already several cases about the open information. When the, the, the general public wants the information, requests the information from the government, if the government refused to provide in due time, the, 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 the general public can, can bring the, the, the suit before the court. So uh, this is a very useful way to push to in promote the enforcement in China. Now we have uh, also a very useful instrument thanks to the development of information technology. We have uh, the 
maybe you know the, the Twitters. I think you know Twitters very well, but in China, fortunately, we don't have Twitter because of the, the some reasons, you know. Yeah. Uh, but we have a Chinese Twitter, the Chinese version of Twitter. It's very popular in China. So, so there we have a many, uh, every day we got many information from Twitter, Chinese Twitter. So, so actually several important uh, cases firstly was released by Twitter, by Chinese Twitter. Uh, and I can give you an example about the uh, uh, PM 2.5 standard. Uh, it's very interesting one that uh, China, has its, China has its own uh, air quality standard. So 2.5 Two point, uh, PM 2.5 are not the standard because we normally they, we, we, we just include the, the, the parcels bigger than the 2.5. But you know the uh, the the US uh, embassy in Beijing released oh, the, yeah. the report every day <laughs> on Chinese Twitter. It is it was followed by million people. Then tens of or hundreds of millions of people. You know. So that formed a great pressure on the government because we have so bad air quality. So they, they have some kind of a debate between if the United States the embassy in Beijing has the authority or the, to, to issue such kind of a report, but uh, finally, the government said, yes, we should revise the air quality uh, standard to include the PM 2.5. <laughs> we have several other uh, examples by the, by the uh, Twitter, Chinese Twitter to, I mean, use the Twitter to, to promote the open information and to, to uh, press the, the the, the government to do something. Because it's a very interesting thing that uh, the, the local government sometimes don't, uh, they are not afraid of the, the protest, but they are very, uh, I would say, uh, the, the, the fear of uh, the media reporting. So if the, especially as I mentioned, it's, uh, maybe the local uh, media cannot report this topic, but uh, other media in, in other neighboring uh, provinces or the uh, central government, uh, the central levels, cent uh, the national levels, uh, once the, 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 the pollution topic was reported by the media, the local government must do something. Mm -hmm. So the to promote the open the, the open information to the general public, uh, to promote uh, to protect the rights of the, the, the people to part participate in some process to sue the government is very important. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a it's a good sign. Actually, it's a, it's very useful to currently a way to promote the open information and to promote the enforcement. Do we have a few more questions from the audience? I see one from Hakim. Um, something quite interesting you said uh, at the end of your lecture, one of the last things you said was the developments in the 21st century regarding the policy of the government. And you said that um, something like the government is now um, following on a principle which has its links to Chinese norms. Or, and I wonder, given that part of the problem will not be just the company's behavior, but that is a large part of it, but that individual attitude to the environment would also be an issue. So I was wondering whether um, that would be really a useful way to go, given that 
you can then identify with the people's culture and beliefs and norms in promoting environmental protection and whether that should be a matter for public edu education and if that is being uh, done beyond just saying that it's part of China's uh, heritage or culture. Mm -hmm. <coughs> There's another question up there. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I'm Said. Um, I'm a PhD student in the law school. And my question is centers on the international politicization of climate change, whereby the United States has given consistent excuse that developing countries have, have to have a shared responsibility on reducing emissions, and China has said that he would never accept international obligation, legal obligation to reduce emissions. What do you think that could be done to either compare China, maybe at the local or international level, or do you see China in the near future accepting legal obligation to reduce or address climate change? Okay, thank you. Uh, so it's a wonderful question. Uh, the, the, uh, actually, uh, uh, as you mentioned, uh, China has a uh, uh, very rich uh, historical or cultural heritage in environmental protection. So it's, uh, it indeed provides many uh, uh, I mean, good or uh, wonderful foundations for the general public to protect the environment. Uh, actually, uh, uh, personally, I think the, the education from the, uh, the government the top-down uh, approach is very successful because you, if you go to China, especially to for the young generations, everybody knows the importance of uh, protecting the environment, the, uh, the environment protection, and uh, especially in the cities. So the, the I mean the environment awareness is already very high, but uh, we need some. Uh, for, for example, hardware or some time to to change the people's behavior gradually. For example, if I have some uh, uh, West sense, I want to throw it into the uh, uh, rubbish bin on the street, but if I go 500 meters, one kilometers, one kilometer, I cannot find the rubbish, uh, rubbish bin. How can I? I will just let it do. Yeah. Mm. So, so the hardware is, is one one problem, one factor. Uh, second is that uh, uh, many people currently now they 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 understand that to collect the, the rubbish at home or at the, the university, but we don't know how to divide into different uh, types. Like Germany, like uh, here, but I think it's good uh, st uh, step for the Ch Chinese people to to collect the, the rubbish, not just the throw it away. You know, so it's a very uh, uh, good uh, uh, science for the, the, the general uh, for for the young generation. Uh, secondly, as mentioned, the, we have a, a uh, growing uh, middle uh, class especially in the uh, uh, coastal and eastern part of China. So the, the, these kind of people, they have the self-interest in environmental protection. So it's very good. Certainly, we now realize that we have a good cultural heritage in protect the environment, especially the rural area. We have so many, I mean, custody laws to protect the, the forest, the water, or something like that. So in some way, we have to criticize the, the, the consumption, consumption pattern of Western countries. I'll give you an example about the conflicts between the, the Chinese uh, tradition and the uh, Western uh, style. We have a very famous uh, lady who uh, Returned from the United States, who live in a, I mean, very uh, expensive uh, 
area, uh, a community in that area. And he, she, she uh, go to the, the, she complained several times because he said uh, the, many people in that area, uh, her neighbors, uh, hung, hung in the, the, the clothes after they washed the clothes. <coughs> he said it's not a civilized <laughs> because the American people just uh, dried, use the drying machine. They won't hide under the, on the, on the sunshine. But another American pe- uh, professor told me after his uh, one year scholarship in China that uh, one of the greatest findings of her is that we can use the sunshine to dry the clothes. <laughs> it's very low carbon <laughs> way. So many people, especially young people, were affected by the Western style's consumption pattern. They changed our behavior. So it's kind of uh, I mean, fighting between the traditional and the so-called modern value of our ways. So in this, uh, in this sense, it's important to keep the tradition. I mean, of course, the, the good side of the, the, the tradition. Uh, as to your question, that uh, uh, China is uh, still a developing country, according to my understanding, especially when you go to cities other than Beijing and Shanghai. Or if you go to Beijing or Shanghai, you will find it's fantastic, it's so modern, and uh, was, it's already a developed country. Maybe Shanghai is more maybe not more, almost the same, like London, Paris, New York. But if you go to the middle part of China or the western part of China, you find that China is still very poor. Oh. So, it's, uh, so the, the priority of the country is still to try to improve the welfare of the citizen. So economic development for China is, is uh, number one goal. Actually, I, I don't believe we have other choice. But the problem is how can you achieve your economic goal? So maybe we, we cannot pursue an unsustainable way. So in terms of the emission, China is number one of emitter of, of CO2, not every uh, uh, greenhouse gases. But in terms of uh, per capita, China is still uh, one tenth of the United States, about one-fourth or one-fifth of the OECD level. In terms of uh, accumulative uh, emission, China only about uh, 8% of the whole world, and the United States 24. So, at this uh, such circumstance, you require China and the United States to, to undertake the same or similar obligation is unfair. Especially uh, for some developed countries, according to the, to the requirement of international law, you are the member, you are the party to the uh, Kyoto Protocol. You did not meet your obligation. Then you require a country without any obligation to do something. Well, it's funny. <laughs> but of course, I don't want to fight him with this uh, idea. Of course, the, because China is, the, the climate change is uh, different with other topics, because climate change is a common problem for, the, for all countries. China cannot just use this excuse to, to, to defend his, itself. China should do something. Actually, China has already did something. Uh, in 2009, China has, uh, has, report, has released a, uh, has issued, uh, I mean, a new uh, target uh, to, to 2040 to 2050, 20% or 40% or something like that, uh, uh, but uh, reduce, uh, to reduce the, 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 the uh, energy intensity uh, per capita or per, 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 per uh, GDP unit. 
So it's not by absolute uh, limitation, but it's kind of uh, uh, intensity the reduction. Uh, in last year, uh, uh, in, 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 I mean, in, no, last year, in Durban, China has already declared that uh, China will accept some kind of uh, obligation that's not absolute cap, but in other ways. So what, what China can accept, for my understanding, is that uh, the, the, this kind of obligation must give China some rules for economic development. Actually, uh, even without the international law obligation, China will reduce its uh, uh, energy uh, consumption and, uh, and emissions because China's uh, economic development is pre pre uh, previously is uh, based on the unsustainable pattern. So now China needs a, a more green, low carbon of the, and the sustainable way. So China's economic development and, uh, cannot rely on the uh, core anymore. They, they must rely on the new alternative renewable energy. So the, the domestic requirement will promote China to do something in control climate change, even without international pressure. So that's the, the reason that China won't, will accept some kind of international obligations. I believe so. Thank, thank you very much. Since we do have refreshments waiting for us, and uh, we can continue talking to our guest lecturer and amongst us, I would like to take this to a conclusion. Um, I was fascinated by the guest, by the lecture, and I will kindly ask you whether we can put the slides that you prepared sure, us yeah. on the center's website. We have also recorded the lecture, and again, we will put it, we will, we will upload it on the center's website. So from the center, we will have. We will get in touch with all members of the audience to let you know when this will happen. And uh, we will also let you know of further activities of the center. As Mark said, this is the first official activity of the center, but there are many more that will come, starting with a very interesting postgraduate colloquium that has been organized mainly by our PhD researchers, and that's on the 6th of June. Now, uh, one last comment from myself, if you don't mind. Whatever you think about environmental law in China, one thing that did strike me when we were talking yesterday was that, as in many countries, if you want to become, if you want to obtain a law degree, there are a number of modules that you have to take. And what you were telling me, if I if I'm not if, if I'm not mistaken, is that in Chinese universities, one of these core mandatory modules is actually environmental law, which does not happen here, as far as I'm aware. Sadly. <laughs> so I thought that was a nice way to conclude this session, and we do have... Uh, yeah, and I'd like to pass to Mark to conclude. Certainly on, on behalf of the law school, I would like, like to, to, to thank um, Jingbao very, very much indeed for his, his excellent lecture. I'm very comforted by the focus on sustainable development, the circular economy law, and the harmony between humans and, and nature in China. It's fascinating traveling in China. I've never seen so many coal trains in my life, but equally, I've never seen so many solar panels in my <laughs> life. So there's, there's clearly there's a transition happening at the moment to cleaner energy, and it's very apparent when you, you, you travel in China. Um, so that's, that's very comforting. But I would like to thank you, and I have a little token as well of our appreciation. So thank you very much. For the thank you. Now, an event like this also takes an awful lot of organization, and I think the first person I would like to thank following our speaker is our chair today, Dr. Francesco Sindico, for chairing so expertly, but also for promoting the event in, in the first place. So thank you very much indeed, Francesco. <laughs>
And behind the scenes, we also have a number of people who deserve thanks. One is Uzuazu Etaniri, who's one of my PhD students, who's been a main mover in uh, one of my many PhD students <laughs> who are in the audience here, um, who is a main mover in actually organizing this. And in addition, um, sadly not here, is my personal assistant, Mrs. Carol Hutton, who is an excellent events organizer, and she shared responsibility, I believe, with Uzuazo. So thank you to both of you. <laughs> and I would also like to thank you, the audience, for coming along and yeah. par participating. So for thank, thank you very much, in, in, indeed. Um, in, in addition, there have been qu quite a number of, of pictures have been taken um, it, it, during, during the event. If anyone is uncomfortable with the idea of their picture appearing on the law school website, I mean, please let, let me know. I mean, I would try to protect people's privacy if they, <laughs> if, 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 if they want. Um, so please just let me know if you're, if, if you're not comfortable about that. And I would now like to invite you to come for some refreshments, which are through the doors at the back and two doors along on the left, and there should be soft drinks, wine, and possibly nibbles to eat. So thank you very much. Thank you.